I was planning on taking a look at Greg Locke's most recent sermon, which just released a couple days ago. Um, this one was on abortion, and he's basically celebrating and talking about what his next steps and hopes and dreams are. But let's just listen to his statements on Roe v. Wade being overturned. Uh, that's at the very beginning here, and we'll go from there. Tell you what, why don't we play a, a video game while we watch? You guys down? All right, let's play some Breath of the Wild for a couple of minutes while we listen to Locke. Side church, we're on the winning side. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! This is his victory lap. I'm glad 46 years ago my mama walked into a doctor's office, and although Roe v. Wade was law then, that doctor said, Get out of here, go have that baby. I'm glad my mama chose life. Hallelujah! Wow, uh, so is this dude saying that his mom intended to like end the pregnancy with him? That's kind of weird, okay. I mean, it's a kind of a weird thing for him to talk about or say or whatever. That's that's all. Aren't you glad your mama chose life? Yes, we celebrate. Yes, we worship. What a victorious opportunity we have today to say thanks be unto God. Almost 50 years. What a stain of God's judgment has been upon this nation. Now we got about 15 states already just in the last couple of days already completely outlawed abortion. Amen. And I'm, I'm, I'm praying ours will be one of them in the next few days. Amen. Absolutely. I don't, are we on the list yet? We're not on that list. Are we on the list now? Compl oh, oh, oh. Give Governor Bill Lee a hand. Thank God he finally stood up and got a backbone. Amen. Yeah, Greg Locke has historically absolutely hated his governor because he calls him a rhino, basically. So if you're unfamiliar with Greg Locke, he's like this gigantic Trump supporter, like to a ridiculous, obnoxious degree. Um, and... I, I think that's waned a little bit since Trump endorsed the vaccines. Greg Locke, he's also a QAnoner. Like, I was just talking about QAnon a minute ago. He buys it. He believes all the conspiracies. And he's Michael Flynn's pastor, which, if you know anything about QAnon, you know that Michael Flynn is an incredibly influential figure within the QAnon movement. So anyway, Bill Lee is not, like, directly behind Donald Trump. I mean, I don't think he even dislikes Trump. I just don't think he was, like, his biggest supporter. And as a result, Greg Locke cannot stand the guy and has gone out and, like, condemned him for just the stupidest stuff. So, yeah, that's his whole bit about Bill Lee. Thank God he finally stood up and got a backbone. Amen. But don't be naive and think the fight's over. The fight's really just begun now. And I choose my words wisely. This is a fight. This is a fight for life. This is a fight for the sanctity of life. This is the fight for a value of life. You know what's weird to me? It's weird that he seems to be under the misconception that the Bible doesn't support abortion, that the Bible or the people in it were pro-life. That is incorrect, good sir. The Bible is very much pro-abortion. I mean... I, Leaving aside the fact that numbers specifically tells people how to have an intentional miscarriage if the father or if the mother was unfaithful or if the father suspects that the mother was unfaithful, leaving that aside, it also says life begins at the first breath. So I honestly am kind of dumbfounded and confused at how these far-right extremist evangelical Christians came to the conclusion that the Bible is like holds the pro-life position. Not in any way, shape, or form does it hold the pro-life position. Not even a little bit. If they're following the Bible, then they should be pro-choice or even pro-abortion. This is a battle. We're in a warfare. And so it's, it's not over. And, and let me say this, I, I get sick of people saying, well, you know, you always have this us and them mentality. There is an us and them mentality. Our side's not burning towns down. Uh, what do you call January 6th? Our side's not out in the streets violating the law and vandalizing buildings and stealing stuff and acting a... What do you call January 6th? 
an event that you were at, by the way, Greg. This us versus them mentality, this is the sign of a cult. This is an extremist group when they have a strong us versus them mentality like this. It's one of the points on the bite model, the model we use to determine if something is a cult or not. It's weird that he's defending the use of an us versus them mentality right now. Fool and burning stuff down. You know what our side's doing? We're rejoicing that there's a God in heaven that's still on the throne that overturned this wicked, vile law that's been babies for almost 50 years. Again, why wouldn't God, why would God allow like this precedent to be set in the first place if he's just going to have it overturned? I don't get it. Why? It logically and theologically makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Almost 65 million of them that we know about. So those 65 million that he's talking about, uh, the abortions, I, I guess, it's not 65 million terminated pregnancies exactly. That's a lot more complicated. A significant percentage of those people had an ectopic pregnancy, which is where basically the the fertilized egg. So you've got uh, you've got these ovaries, right? And they contain the eggs, and they are connected to the uterus through these things called the fallopian tubes, right? So once a month, the egg go travels through the fallopian tube or tubes. There are two two of them, and goes to the uterus, right? And that's when you can get pregnant. Except sometimes, on rare occasions, but statistically significant occasions, the egg doesn't travel through the fallopian tubes. It gets stuck in the tubes. And if you get pregnant during that time when it's stuck in the tubes, guess what happens? Your life is in deep danger. You cannot have a baby that way. You will die if you don't have that terminated. There is no way to save it. There is no way to save you. That is a statistically significant portion of terminated pregnancies. It doesn't matter how pro-life you are, it's not going to work in that case. And you just made it illegal for these people's lives to be saved. Like I said, this is not a small segment of the population. This happens fairly frequently. Not to mention in vitro fertilization. You can't do that under a lot of these uh, these restrictions anymore either. People who desperately want a baby can't have them anymore because they are restricted and banned under the new rules. There's no logic to be had in all of this. It is ideology and nothing else, and it's so deeply sad. This isn't just like, oh, I don't want a baby, so I'm going to have an abortion. That's not what this is. This is people are actually going to die as a direct result of what just happened. Don't get me started. And so we actually going to have the whole service to celebrate. So I don't, I don't want to let too much out of the bag because I got some preaching to do here in just a little bit. And I'm super excited about it. Super excited about it. So let me just say this right at the beginning before we take up an offering. And, and we could have had no idea when we released a video last week that this was going to happen and transpire the way it did. And this offering was already planned. And you'll know why in a minute. But aren't you glad you serve a sovereign God that's in control of every chess piece on the board? Amen. If he's in control of every chess piece on the board, then why are you always complaining about the liberals, this and that, and all this other crazy stuff that you're complaining about? Aspie Alex, why are you watching videos of Greg Locke sped up? Dude talks at a million miles an hour at normal speed. That's true. I I wanted to proof this video and make sure that it didn't have anything like really, really messed up or disturbing in it, basically. Because uh, I didn't want to play it if it was going to be too like not safe for, for work for YouTube, if you will. That's why I was watching it double speed. I just want to make sure he didn't say something crazy. And he does say some disturbing stuff in the opening here, but... Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm going to skip past some of it. So anyway. Now, not everybody is excited about the Roe v. Wade being overturned. Not everybody's excited about the, uh, the states standing up for their rights and standing up for babies. OK, so not everybody's happy about that. And I. Well, they're not babies. 
Like I said, the egg that was fertilized in the fallopian tube is not a baby. It is a fertilized egg. It's literally 150 cells. And saving the person's life by terminating that, that that failed pregnancy that didn't take, that's not like murder. That's saving a person's life. It's a distinct difference. The fact that he even refers to a fertilized egg with 150 cells as a baby is propaganda. Leah Grace, I saw someone posting today about how miscarriages and ectopic pregnancies aren't abortions and aren't at risk. Thoughts slash how to respond? That's incorrect. That's simply incorrect. There are a, bu- there are a bunch of states that have banned it outright and s- more that are setting out to ban it or that are planning to ban it. And aside from all of that, I can make a case for the morality of abortion anyways. Like, not counting ectopic pregnancy, not counting, you know, any of the other stuff. It's moral, in my opinion, to get abortions. So, anyway. I'm not naive. There's a lot of people that are confused. There are a lot of people that are, as we're going to see in the text in a few moments, they're just under a seducing spirit. They don't know any better. They're under a... uh, demonic attack that they can be released from by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Uh, This is the interesting thing about Greg Locke. He believes that spirits, like demons, literal demons, are responsible for every societal ill, every one of them. You have an addiction. It's It's the demon that has the name Pharma. The demon is named Pharma. And it is the reason why you're suffering. And you, if you, if Greg Lock came in with an like a deliverance team and exercised the demon of pharma, you would no longer be addicted. Seriously, that's what he believes. No joke. They're they're effectively witches for Jesus. You know all the things that Christians believe witches do, uh, fortune telling and divining and blah blah blah. They believe they can do all that stuff too, just like a witch except they're doing it with God's power rather than Satan's power as they view or as they believe that witches do. Um, And that's why I call their weird little cults, not evangelicals, not Pentecostals, but I call them witches for Jesus. I think that's the name I'm coming up with. That we just sang about and we're about to preach about. But uh, let me just say this. We want a, we want a good service today. Okay, we've had to enhance security measures over the course of the last couple of days just because of all of the online vitriol and, and uh, pray, pray for everybody that's been in the fight. Uh, Ken Peters, they're having to literally vet every single person that comes to Patriot Church today. That may seem a little overbearing, but we got to protect the house. Amen. We gotta- I don't know if you guys know Patriot Church, but it is just a crazy church. Uh, and he's really good friends with Patriot Church's pastor, Ken Peters. They, I think Greg Locke donated like $100,000 to it or something like that. Well, anyway, uh, Ken Peters created his church, obviously named Patriot Church, not just about Jesus, but also about like Donald Trump. It's a church dedicated to Donald Trump and Jesus both. They seem to believe that they're both equally as significant in God's plan, both Jesus and Donald Trump. Like, they view him as like the new Messiah, effectively. It's just bizarre stuff, man. Make sure, and of course, a long time ago, we put up signs that said no large bags, no backpacks, and people wonder why. If they read our mail, they'd know why. And so let me just say this, and I want to be as shepherdly and as kind about it as I can. I love to see all these fans. Y'all getting some Fitbit exercise today, praise God. Your Fitbit's going to think you got 25,000 steps and all you did was come to church. Apparently it's really hot in there, so they're like waving their stuff around. Fanning yourself with these funeral <laughs> fans. But I want, to be, uh, I want to be diplomatic in how I say this. Probably, probably not everybody under the tent is nearly as, as excited as we are about Roe versus Wade. Now, you're, if that's the case, you either accidentally showed up or you're here for the wrong reason. So let me just say, if you are here for the wrong reason, I'm gonna take about 10 seconds and let you get it out of your system. Is that fair? Is that fair? So if you're gonna shuck your clothes off and you're gonna try to protest like they've been doing online, if you're gonna hold up signs, if you're gonna call us racist, homophobic, bigots, whatever, okay? 
pro-life is really pro-death. Okay, I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. Now, if you don't take it during this 10 seconds, the moment you do it while I'm preaching, we're going to throw you to the ground and drag your carcass out of this place, kicking and screaming, call the law on you and put your butt in jail. You understand? Genius. Yeah, threat and violence against anybody who wants to exercise their right to peacefully protest. That's great. Totally a free speech church, right? Absolutely, 100%. Uh, oh, and by the way, Greg, you can't call yourself pro-life if you are also pro-death penalty. You just can't. I'm sorry. They are logically inconsistent positions. You're not pro-life. You are pro-death. So you got 10 seconds from right now to go ahead and get your protest out of the way. Just go ahead. If you're here to protest, I promise you this is the time you're going to want to do it. You ready? Here we go. All right, I gave you 12. Just Did he? Is Was that 12 seconds? I just want to see. Uh, he stopped at 34.04, so... No, he didn't. He didn't give anybody 12. He gave them 9 seconds. Okay, that was not 12. I prefer accuracy, personally. Just to give you an extra 2 seconds for the people that are late bloomers in life, okay? So that was it. That was your chance right there. Is it, was that fair or not? Was that fair or not? I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm trying to be fair. So that was your opportunity. So if you take over the service and do it, there ain't going to be no fair. You hear me? There's going to be no fair. None. I promise you. We're going to drag you out on a live stream and embarrass you in front of the whole world. He, this is threatening protesters is what this is. But that's what he's doing right now. He's threatening protesters. Because if you are dumb enough to not take the 12 seconds we just gave you, then we're courageous enough to drag you out of here kicking and screaming. Okay? We will lay hands on you in the name of Jesus, and we will drag you out of this tent. So you had your chance. A bunch of people online like, I wish I was there. Yeah, we wish you were too, Skippy. We wish you were too. It, it, this is threatening violence, right? I mean, I can't see how this is interpreted any other way. I'm done with these baby mongrels. I ain't got time for them. I've been fighting them for years. I'm going to fight them for another dozen years, another 50 years if God gives me bread. They ain't going to threaten me and my family in this church. We're going to stand for what's right, amen. So you had your opportunity, and so you can, you can sit on your sign in case you somehow slipped it in. But I just want to get all that out of the way. I was just going to be fair. I got more stuff to say here in a little bit. I'm pretty excited about it. We had no idea last week when we released uh, our first teaser, if you will, for a movie that our... This is just his opening bit in this sermon. I figured I was going to skip forward a little bit because this stuff he says in here, like from here for isn't really that relevant. He's talking about... He's basically trying to promote his movie that he's making, and I really don't care. We had no idea last week when we released uh, our first teaser, if you will, for a movie that our church is going to be... See, I don't even care about his movie, honestly. It's completely irrelevant to me. It means nothing. That, that, that's why I'm skipping forward, okay? So as we skip forward a little bit further, there's a guy that comes out to sing on stage, and he delivers a message before he sings... So I wanted to listen to this guy's message that he wanted to deliver. I don't want to listen to the song because the song sucks, just like the movie sucks. Um, but after we listen to the guy here, this, this is the dude right here. After we listen to him give his little message, we'll skip forward to Greg Locke's sermon, and that's when the crazy really starts. So give this a listen and see what this guy has to say. Jesus and all of God's people said, God bless you as you give. I heard a statistic this week. I don't know if it's true, but if it is, it's sad. I heard a statistic this week. I don't know if it's true, but he's going to repeat it anyways without any evidence. All right, lay it on me. What's your statistic, bud? But if it is, it's sad. It's that one in four women have had an abortion. And I, I feel like a lot... I think that one in four women have had an abortion. Let's see if that's actually real or not. You better hope that's not the real statistic, because if it is, that means that many more people, they'll be more likely to vote for the person who would codify it. It's a New York Times article on it. Um, abortions have declined over time. 
apparently. So the abortion rate in 1973 to 2020. Hang on, I'll just let me pull it up on screen so you guys can see it too. Just a second. Uh, New York Times article here says this is the abortion rate right here uh, from 1973 to 2020. I guess the very peak here was 30 abortions per 1,000 women. Um, and currently at this moment, it looks like it's about 14.4 percent or 14.4 per 1,000 women. Uh, that's not 14 and a half percent. That's 1.4 four percent because it's it's per thousand women so we have to move the decimal place over this is 1.4 percent of the population of the of the female population gets abortions that's what that means americans are having half as many as 30 years ago researchers say a variety of factors including better contraceptive use and less sex among teenagers is leading to fewer unintended pregnancies the data offers a broad outline of abortion in the U.S. today and who may be most affected now that Roe v. Wade has been overturned by the Supreme Court. 9% were teenagers. 28% were 20 to 24 years old. 29% were 25 to 29 years old. 20% were 30 to 34. And then 15% were 35 or older. Uh, has attended some college. So I guess 41% of the people who responded, or 41% of the people who've had abortions, were they attended some college. 23% were college graduates. 27% completed high school. And 9% had no high school degree. Imagine having no high school degree and being a teenager and needing an abortion. Just... God. And these people have reversed the ability for people to get what they need. Absolutely disturbing stuff. Income is a percentage of the poverty line. So 49% of the people who get an abortion are below poverty level. 26% are up to twice poverty level. And 25% are more than twice poverty level. So I think poverty level, what is poverty level now? It used to be 14000 a year was poverty level. What is poverty poverty level? It's twenty six thousand a year, I guess. Twenty six thousand a year in D.C. is poverty level, apparently. For a family a household of four persons living in one of the forty eight contiguous states of the of D.C., the poverty guideline for twenty twenty one is twenty six thousand five hundred. Separate poverty guideline figures are developed for Alaska and Hawaii, and different guidelines may apply to blah blah blah. Okay, so what is the poverty level? Generally, I can just go to the living wage calculator in like MIT's living wage calculator. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. Check this out. This is MIT's living wage calculator. It will tell you they keep this up to date to the best of my knowledge. It'll tell you what the living wage is for different areas. So just take a look at like West Virginia, for example, and look at Cabell County. Where the hell is it? There it is. Okay, Cabell County, one adult, one child. Living wage is $30.64 an hour. Poverty wage is $8.38 an hour. Minimum wage is eight seventy five. dollars Two adults, one child, one adult working, twenty nine fifty three dollars an hour. Because you don't need child care. That's really interesting. So what is $30 an hour exactly? That's... uh. Say 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, 62000 a year. That's living wage in Cabell County, West Virginia, for one adult and one child, or two adults, one working. Poverty wage is 838 So that's 18000 a year, basically. Poverty wage is 18000 a year in West Virginia. So 49% of the people who get abortions make less than 18000 a year. 26% of the people who get abortions make 36000 a year, up to 36000 a year. And then 25% of the people who get them make more than 36000 a year, basically. That's the bottom line here. Wow. 
Progress only. Your you did yours, and it's lower than the West Virginia example. That's crazy. I thought Cabell County was the lowest cost place in the entire country. Honestly, that's nutty. Here's the bottom line. This guy on the Greg Locke video made the claim that one in four women have had abortions. He says, "I don't know if it's true or not." Then don't say it. You're uh, you're in front of a gigantic audience, probably of millions of people including the cameras and everything else, don't quote false facts. And I just don't know, dude. I just don't know. It's not good. Don't do that shit. The 25% of women have an abortion in their lifetime statistic appears to be accurate. Interesting. Okay. Hang on. Let's see. Let, let me see if I can pull this up. Do one in four women undergo an abortion in their lifetime? This is a Snopes article, apparently. Roughly one in four women in the U.S. have at least one abortion in their lifetime, mostly true. A peer-reviewed study published in 2017 estimated that in 2014, some 23.7% of girls and women in the U.S., or roughly one in four, had undergone at least one abortion between the ages of 15 and 44. Interesting. What's undetermined? It's, it's possible that the lifetime incidence of abortion changed between 2014 and 2020. And there's good reason to believe it may specifically have declined. Weird. So I guess 1.4% of women have abortions, according to the New York Times. 14 in every 1,000 women in 2020 have an abortion. But 23% of women will have one in their lifetime. I'm confused how those numbers connect to each other, but okay. In 2019 and 2020, readers asked Snopes to examine the widely shared claim that one in four women undergo an abortion during their lifetime. In particular, readers cited a viral post on, with a Facebook page, I'm sorry, uh, on the Facebook hashtag, which read, one in four women will have an abortion in their lifetime, maybe your mother, sister, cousin, best friend, etc. And while they may... Sh while they may not shout it out from the mountaintops, they're reading your posts about how you think they're garbage human beings for making a choice that they agonized over and was best for them. If it's not your pregnancy, it's not your business, and your lack of compassion does not go unnoticed. Mind your own uterus and stop worrying about something that has zero effect on you. The same message was shared multiple times in social media and online. The earliest example Snopes found was published on February 2nd, 2019. But the meme experienced something of a revival in October 2020 for reasons that are unclear. The claim that one in four women have an abortion in their lifetime has also been used by those opposed to abortion rights, such as Human Coalition. The figure of one in four women appears to derive from an estimate published in the American Journal of Public Health, a peer-reviewed journal in 2017. As such, it's significant evidenti uh, as such, it has significant evidentiary backing. However, the data in that study were collected in 2014, and as such, they are at least six years old as of 2020. Taking into account the possibility that the trend has changed in the past six years, we're issuing a rating of mostly true. Interesting. It came from American Journal of Public Health. I would love to see the study. I'm not saying it's uh, incorrect. I'm just not sure how the New York Times data matches up with this data that's from the American Journal of Public Health. Interesting. Well, anyways, yeah, so there you go. There's the information. You have it. If you ever need it, you've got it locked and loaded, just in case. God bless you as you give. I heard a statistic this week. I don't know if it's true, but if it is, it's sad. It's that one in four women have had an abortion. And I, I feel like a lot of them are just trying to suppress a, 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 the shame and guilt that they feel. And I believe we're about to enter into a new season where not only babies are gonna be given the chance at life, but these women are gonna be given the chance of forgiveness and grace is gonna be poured out on them. I'm just, I'm declaring it, I'm prophesying it this morning. If that's you and you're in this room this morning and you've had an abortion, you're watching online, I just wanna to say to you, come to the altar because the Father's arms are open wide. There's grace for you, there's forgiveness for you. He will take your shame, he will take your guilt. 
and they were replaced. There is no shame or guilt about having an abortion. It is literally a clump of cells and nothing more. There is no reason to be hesitant about it. Just do it if you need to do it. Seriously. Do it rather than have it ruin your life. It is so deeply sad that people are so propagandized that they wouldn't just go have this done. Come on. And lift the spirit of heaviness and love on you. And I just want to sing this song over those, those women because I believe there's healing coming for those women today. Okay, now he's going to sing, and I'm, I'm not really into hearing his stupid song. I'm really here to listen to nutbaggery and wingnuttery of all different sorts, so let's see. Yeah, okay, this is roughly where it's still. Look at the crowd, dude. The crowd is throwing their hands up like they just don't care. Dancing, swaying back and forth. Oh, so glad to be here. These people are extremists. Every single person in this crowd is an extremist. Like, willing to use violence to get what they want. And this guy in the background, is this a Nirvana shirt? Please don't tell me he likes Nirvana. I can't imagine it'd be a Nirvana shirt at a Greg Locke thing. Anyway, all right, let's listen to Locke and see what he has to say here on this subject. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I want to invite you as a text today, and we're actually going to be several places. I recognize the fact that it will pop up on the media screens here in a few moments, but I trust that you'll have a Bible handy. I'm going to work you a little bit more than I normally would. We believe in verse by verse, line by line, word by word preaching here in our church, but sometimes we have to do that by going to multiple places. And because of the material, which is not going to be anywhere near exhaustive today, we're going to actually go a couple of spots. And so today is going to feel a little bit more like a Wednesday night. And if you don't know what I mean by that, then maybe you ought to show up on a Wednesday night because we have a lot more time in our Bible study and we kind of go different places. And I know many of you watch it, but we're going to be several places today. But First Timothy, the fourth chapter, is where we're actually going to begin. And then we have two or three other spots that I just want to read and just make some, really just some comments today, just a burden that's on my heart. Obviously, you cannot let a day like this go by. You cannot let a weekend like this go by after fighting so hard, so long, and so uh, vigorously without just really going into the text of the Word of God to see why we're in this fight to begin. You shouldn't be going, like, if you actually went into the text of God to find out why you're in this fight in the first place, you wouldn't be in this fight. Of course, he's talking about Roe v. Wade and the fight against it. If, if you had actually read your Bible, you would see that the Bible is fully in support of abortion. I really don't know how they get the pro-life position from the Bible. I mean, even setting aside Numbers 5, 11 to 31, which is fully in support of abortion, even setting that aside, there are other passages in the Bible that support it. Like the verse that says a baby isn't a life until it takes its first breath. You remember that verse? There are a billion examples. The Bible is pro-abortion. How do they get anti how do they get anti-abortion from the bible i don't know blows me away with but i want to bring it to to light perhaps in a different way than you're used to hearing it but you will you will understand the reason that i'm bringing it through the back door because we're a church that believes in deliverance ministry we believe you won't be able to bring it through the back door for long they're re-evaluating lawrence v texas too so I, if you're going to bring it through the back door there, Locke, I'd do it soon. By the way, Lawrence v. Texas was the sodomy one. It was the sodomy case. I just <laughs> That was a deep lore joke that I made. Okay, let me step back. <laughs> Eve, that so much of what we're seeing is not that we're wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. My fight is not with people. My fight is with the spirit inhabiting those people. Yeah, but you have to hurt the people themselves to accomplish your goal, right? That's why he specifically said earlier, if you remember, he was going to drag people out kicking and screaming and, and not be gentle with them when he did, like if they stood up to protest. You remember he said that earlier? Now, if you don't take it during this 10 seconds, the moment you do it while I'm preaching, we're going to throw you to the ground and drag your carcass out of this place, kicking and screaming, call the law on you and put your butt in jail. You understand that? 
So obviously he's, he has an interest in getting violent with protesters. Um, and for what it's worth, the word carcass, I believe, means dead body, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It means dead body. He said, we're going to throw you to the ground and drag your carcass out of here. I'm sure that's not what he actually meant, but the fact that he used the word that refers to a dead body, that alone is disturbing. That, that alone is disturbing to me. In my church, they use Psalm 139, 13 to 16 as the pro-life argument. Is that the one where they dash babies' heads against rocks, or is that a different one? Because that's in the Bible, too. I, I vividly remember reading that in the Bible. Okay, let's read it. Psalm 139, 13 to 16. This is the verse they use to justify their pro-life position. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in this secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my own unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Interesting. Well, that, I believe, is specifically talking about a prophet and the fact that God knew this prophet before he was born. I, it's, it even says before he was even being formed, right? It says, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. So it was before he's even in his mother, apparently. It was when he was in the depths of the earth. This is, from my understanding, talking about one specific person. But there are countless examples of the Bible being pro-abortion. You are perfectly allowed to get an abortion, according to the Bible. And it even encourages it. And the Jewish faith today, abortion is a requirement in some cases. I don't know where they think they're getting their justification for being pro-life from. In all seriousness, it's piss poor. It is a piss poor interpretation. Did you see Biden's tweet on suspending the filibuster to get Roe v. Wade codified into law? No, 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 I didn't. What did he say? God, there's so much happening today. It's crazy. We have to codify Roe v. Wade into law, and as I said this morning, if the filibuster gets in the way, then we need to make an exception to get it done. Wow. So Biden wants to remove the filibuster. Well, that's great. That's all fine and dandy. But where are you getting the votes to do that? It's easy to say when there's no chance of it happening. How do you even remove a filibuster, for that matter? I thought you needed 60 votes in the Senate. Am I incorrect there? It can't just be removed. They only have... 52 senators or 51 no no no. they only have 50 they only have 50 senators and two of those senators won't vote with them on anything they can filibuster the vote to remove the filibuster you only need a majority to change the rules of the senate no really do you really only need a majority to change the rules of the senate i did not know that is that true just performative speak biden doesn't have the power to do it no biden doesn't but the fact that he's supporting it is a big deal because up to now, he has not supported removing the filibuster. And actually, I don't support removing the filibuster either. Uh, this is a special case, but you know what Republicans are going to do in the Senate once they have the power and once the filibuster is gone. Anyways, there are 100 senators total, right? And 50 of them are Democrats. 50 are Republicans right now. But Kamala Harris... The vice president is the tie-breaking vote in the Senate if there is a tie. So, effectively, Republicans control the Senate technically, but just barely. They can't do basically anything. Okay, let me explain like, like your five. Uh, somebody asked if I could explain like your five. If you want a bill to get passed, you need the House of Representatives, which is 438 people. You need them to vote on it and pass it through to the Senate. How many House members a state gets depends on the population. So West Virginia, I think they have three House members. But every single state has two senators, no matter what. They all have two senators. And there are 50 states, so that means there are 100 senators, right? Once the House votes on a bill and approves it, it goes to the Senate. Now the Senate can vote on the bill. If the Senate votes on the bill and the House has already voted on the bill, then the bill passes. But there's this thing called the filibuster. Historically, it was this thing where you could prevent a vote from being held on the Senate floor by standing up there and 
reading something or talking, like as long as you were talking, they couldn't bring the bill to a vote. As long as somebody was up there, you know, saying something. Robert C. Byrd, I think, has the record for talking the longest. I think he talked for 24 hours straight one time. He was trying to prevent the Senate from holding a vote on the Civil Rights Act because he knew there were enough senators, there was a majority of senators who wanted to pass the Civil Rights Act. So unless you have 60 votes, you can't overturn the filibuster. If you have 60 votes, you can overturn the filibuster. Well, not too long ago, they overturned the need to speak, basically. You don't have to stand up there and talk for ever to prevent it from going to a vote. Now, if the party doesn't have 60 votes, you just lose. You can't, they won't bring it to a vote. You can't debate it or any of that. You need 60 votes. That's what Mitch McConnell removed the, it was called the nuclear option, I believe. And he removed the requirement for people to talk, which made it a lot harder to get anything passed, basically, unless you hold a supermajority in the Senate. So now Biden is saying he wants to remove the filibuster entirely so you can just have a majority, just 50 senators or 51 senators is all you need to pass a law now. That's what Biden wants to do. And I'm actually not in favor of that. I'm in favor of going back to the old rules, the way it was before. Mitch also removed the filibuster for court judge nominations, right? And they pushed through a bunch of judges and stuff. It wasn't good. Well, anyway, Mitch McConnell has eroded democracy more than any other single human in, so in many ways. Maybe Trump takes the cake for having eroded democracy more than any other single human, but it's close. Anyways, um... So that's what the filibuster is in simple terms. Uh, Biden wants to remove it. I don't because when the Republicans take the Senate back, which is inevitable, they are going to, they're going to reshape America in disturbing, horrific ways because the filibuster is gone. I'm in favor of setting up the old rules, personally. Uh, let's keep listening to uh, what Locke has to say here. Mitch McConnell is a terrible human being. Intimidated either. Lord bless, I know it's hot under this tent, and I pray that you would help us to focus, to not be distracted, and over the course of the next few moments, I pray that you would get every ounce, every drop of glory and honor and praise and adoration and worship. You alone are worthy of it all, and we thank you for what you're going to speak into our hearts in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said. 1 Timothy chapter number 4, I'm only going to read the first verse for time's sake. I want to talk a little bit about it, and then we're going to backtrack in the Bible, as I said, and we're going to move right along. Keep on using those fans. It won't hurt me one bit. It's like the butterfly effect, amen? We'll create a, uh, a little bit of a cool wave in here. And if you Oh, yeah, they're in a tent, so I bet they don't have air conditioning in there. That, that would make sense. That's probably why he's trying to get people to fan toward him a little bit more, I suppose. Um, wow, that's miserable. God, I, I would hate it to be in a gigantic tent full of people that had no air conditioning. He should really just get a building, honestly. He's rich enough for it, I'm sure. It gets hot in the chips. It's about 10 degrees hotter up here with a suit on, and I'm about burning slap up, amen, but I'm going to preach and have a good time. First Timothy 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit, say Spirit. Spirit. That's capital S. That's the Holy Ghost. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, meaning by that, he's going to hurry up about it. This is of immediate. This is important. This is what we would say ASAP. The Spirit is going to tell us something that's not only important, but it's so demonstrative that he says it expressly, that in the latter times. Now look at me, church. We are in the latter times, and we've been in the latter times for 2,000 years. Everybody says, where are the signs of his coming? If you can't see the signs of his coming, you're not reading a Bible, you're not using your brain, and your head has been placed in the sand like an ostrich. We okay, let me phrase it for you this way, Locke. What I... The signs of the times were earthquakes, plagues, uh, war, things like that, right? Let, let me frame it a little bit differently for you and ask you this. What are the signs of the times taking place right now that weren't happening a thousand years ago or 500 years ago? Or, hell, show me the signs of the times that are happening 
now, but were not happening when Jesus was on earth. This needs to be different. This needs to be extraordinary. This needs to stand out. The Black Plague was worse than coronavirus. Objectively, it killed more people. We had absolutely no clue how to solve that problem at the time. The plagues, the wars were worse. Everything was worse back then. Even the earthquakes were worse. Because they had no way of detecting them before they happened. They didn't understand how to build a building in a, in a way that would protect it from earthquakes. They didn't know where earthquakes are going to happen. Now we know where earthquakes are going to happen, and we can be more careful about it. Even the earthquakes were worse back then. So I really don't know why he believes that the signs of the times are more clear now than they have ever been. I need to see signs of the times that are extraordinary, that are set apart from other times. We're watching things happen at an alarming rate. We are watching the world turn at an alarming rate. We are watching right now as Israel, the breadbasket of the world, is showing us, church, lift up your head because your redemption draweth nigh. We are... Wait, did he say the br Israel's the breadbasket of the world? I thought that was Ukraine. Isn't Ukraine the breadbasket of the world? I, I, isn't that what they were called? Or the breadbasket of Europe? Why is he calling Israel the breadbasket? That's weird, right? watching things happen all over this world that God said was going to pop right off the pages of the New Testament, and the newspaper and the New Testament are reading one and the same because prophecy is being fulfilled right now. The newspaper and the New Testament are reading the same. <clears throat> They've been reading the exact same way since the dawn of time, since the New Testament was written, there have always been wars and earthquakes and plagues and all that stuff. This is not new. You need to give me something that's extraordinary and new to make me believe that we're in the end times. Thanks for explaining that they are actually in a tent. I am British and wondered if it was just an, uh, an affectation. No, yeah, they're in a tent, a giant circus tent. Like Greg Locke bought a humongous canvas tent and you know set it up and that's where he holds service and again no air conditioning or anything like that and in fact they don't even have like a floor they just have hay on the floor i believe this is 5650 5650 if you look down here you can see their floor hang on here you go see the floor it looks like it's not really grass i think it's hay in some parts at the very least Kind of hard to make it out, but yeah, there you go. There's some hay. You can you can see it there. Kind of like a carnival or a circus or whatever. That's how it's set up. Is being fulfilled right now. Right this very moment, and yes, for 2,000 years, we've been living in the latter days, but now we're in the latter of the latter days. Hey, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Why is it that every doomsday cult in history seems to believe we're in the last days of the last days, and they even use that phrase. Listen to this one. This is Stephen Lett from Jehovah's Witnesses. The spread of this disease is distressing, to be sure. But we're really not uh, surprised to see the world in the grip of such pestilence, are we? God, I love this. This, is, this guy's mannerisms are so bizarre. Jesus made it clear at Luke 21, 11, that pestilence would be part of the sign of the last days. And in Revelation chapter 6, the ride of the fourth horseman includes mention of deadly plague. So the events unfolding around us are making clearer than ever that we're living in the final part of the last days Undoubtedly, the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last days. Yeah, so I I don't know what it is about cult leaders where they love to talk about the last day of the last days shortly before the last day of the last days or something or other, but I, I don't know. It's just a weird obsession with them, apparently. 
right this very moment. And yes, for 2,000 years, we've been living in the latter days. But now we're in the latter of the latter days. And I want to say this about the latter. You know, they've been saying that exact thing since Jesus' time. They've been saying we're in the last days of the last days. And it's coming any five minutes now since then. Jesus' apostles believed it was coming in their lifetime. And here we are, 2,000 years later. Nothing. How about that? Matter of the latter days. And I want to say this about the latter days. God said in the latter days, there's going to be a latter rain, and I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And the greatest revival that the world has ever seen, not a third great awakening, no, the greatest revival that the world has ever seen has already begun in the church of the living God in America and around the world. And you better know that the overturning of Roe v. Wade just shows us that God's one step ahead of the devil. Ladies and gentlemen, I said he's one step ahead of the devil. And in the why did, if God's one step ahead of the devil and you're using Roe v. Wade as evidence of that, why did God allow Roe v. Wade to go through in the first place 50 years ago? I don't understand. Latter days, God's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Now we got to roll, I'm only in the first sentence. It says some, notice it does not say all. There will be a remnant of righteous people that rise up and say enough's enough. It does not say everyone will leave. Everyone will jump ship. Everyone will depart. It says and some. Now we know that the some will be a massive multitude and we're beginning to watch it right now. But some shall depart from the faith. My question is, if they had no faith, yeah, so Jehovah's Witnesses refer to this verse as the greater number verse, basically. In 1975, give or take, Jehovah's Witnesses were... Well, okay, so leading up to 1975, Jehovah's Witnesses believed that the end was coming that year. Hang on. The theology behind it is kind of complicated, but they think that they have an exact time frame for how long it took God to create Eve after creating Adam. They think it was, I forget, 47 years? They're very, very specific with how long they think it was. I don't remember exactly how they got there and why they believe it was 47 years, but if you take 47 years and add it to Jesus 33 years, middle, 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 1975 is an exact value, exactly the right amount of time after Adam and Eve were created or whatever else. And they believe that that is like when God started resting. So God rested on the sixth day and he was going to bring everything down after a thousand years or something or other. Anyways, it's a big, long, complicated thing, and some Jehovah's Witness out there will be able to explain it better than I am right now. But anyway, they believed that 1975 was going to be the end for them, for everybody. They thought the end was coming, and there's going to be a great tribulation, and then Armageddon, and blah, 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 in 1975. And they were telling people to sell their stuff and donate it to the organization and everything else. And when they did, and nothing happened in 1975, massive amounts of people left the organization. They all quit. They walked away. And what did Jehovah's Witnesses say about that? How did they respond to people leaving when they found out there were false prophets? They said, the Bible says the greater number will cool off in the end, which is basically what Locke is saying here. There will be a remnant of a church left because everyone else is going to leave. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. That's the exact same verse that Jehovah's Witnesses quoted when they gave their false prophecy about 1975. He says in the latter times things will get so deceptive, so deceiving, so demonically diabolical, that those that knew the faith and spread the faith and shared their faith and were in the faith that people of the faith shall depart. Believers 
in the church, in the Bible, grew up in Sunday school, they shall depart from the faith. And notice why they depart, because the underlying reason for them leaving the faith is what I want to talk about for the next few moments. Ooh, he's going to talk about how disgusting and corrupt the church is, right? His included, of course. Giving heed. It means to listen to. It means to be admonished by. Do you understand? There's some people and some things you ought not listen to. There are some influences that you should not be influenced by. Am I making sense? Somebody say amen in his house. This isn't very free speech, is it? He's saying that you shouldn't even listen to what these people are saying. This is a, this is a quick way to extremism. This is one of the hallmarks of extremism. Closing your eyes and your ears and refusing to listen to what somebody has to say. He said they will give heed, they will pay attention, they will give in, they will compromise. To what? To seducing spirits. Not just to ideologies. Not just compromising and giving in because their family has rejected them and told them they can't come back to Thanksgiving or Christmas meal. Not just the fact that they're going to lose their job and experience some social media, Facebook persecution. Oh, no. They will leave the faith to give in, to compromise, to... Wait a minute. Some social media persecution. Can I, I'm just going to step back, listen to that again. He's talking about the people who are religious, right? He's talking about religious people. They're going to face social media persecution, and their families are going to ban them from, like, Thanksgiving because they don't want religious people around, supposedly, right? And the social media persecution... <laughs> this is so ridiculous, dude. So deeply ridiculous. The social media persecution of white, straight Christian men is going to lead to them leaving Christianity because so many people hate Christians, right? Is that, is that, am I reading this correctly? Some social media Facebook persecution. Oh no, they will leave the faith to give in to compromise to seducing spirits. You do understand that that means demons right there. What kind of a delusional world do you have to live in to believe that you are persecuted as a white, straight male Christian. Seriously. You do not live in the same world as everybody else. You really don't. That the church will be under so much spiritual warfare that people will literally lay down the armor of God and decide on purpose by their own decision and volition to be seduced by demons. Greg Locke believes that demons and spirits are the same thing. And he also believes that any ailment that you have, any at all, any situation you're dealing with in your life, drug addiction comes to mind specifically because he talks about this a lot. If you are addicted to something, it's because you're being possessed, like literally possessed, by the demon of pharma. And if you had Greg Locke come in and exercise that demon from you through, you know, chants and prayer and all that stuff, the demon of pharma would release you and you would no longer be addicted. Seriously. This is, this is how he views things. This is how he views the world. He lives in a completely different world than the rest of us, honestly. He really does. And if you don't think that's what the context means, notice he says and, which is a bridge-building word. There's furthermore to this. And doctrines, there it is, of devils. He said they're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. They're going to give in to demonology. They're going to give in to the New Age gurus of the world. They're going to give in to Eastern mysticism. They're going to give in to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. There's a lot of religious and denominational doctrines of demons that's floating around the church world. We'll have to take another day and another message to be able to expose any and all of them. There are many. If you've never been to one of our deliverance services, we take a good few moments and we deal with religious spirits. Because how many of you know the spirit of religion is the one thing dragging this nation to hell? Because 
Remember I said a minute ago, the spirit of pharma, which is the demon of pharma, he believes, is what causes people to be addicted to things. And if you exercise the demon, like do a full-blown exorcism of the demon of pharma, it will get rid of the demon from your life. Well, here he goes again talking about the demon of religion or false religion is probably what he's talking about or what he believes to be false religion, possessing people. He believes that the demon of religion is possessing people. Americans know just enough Bible to be dangerous enough to die in their sin. And so he said in the last days, in these latter times, it would be dangerous for many reasons, but one of the greatest is that church people will leave the faith of the church of the living God. They'll leave the power and the glory of the gospel. They'll leave the presence and the giftings and the workings of the Holy Spirit because they've been deceived by spirits and doctrines of demons. And we've seen many people, not just from our church, but many people depart the faith because of the cultural nonsense that we see all about us right now this morning. You know, it's interesting. How many can I use loosely the term celebrity Christians? Like yourself? I've gotten on their Twitter feed in the last couple of years and saying, well, you know, I just, I don't quite believe my childhood faith the way that I did. We're talking about great big singers CCM Dove Award winning individuals. Yeah, this is where I stopped listening originally when I was trying to proof it. I wanted to make sure that it was appropriate and it wasn't going to, you know. I, I was hoping he wasn't going to, like, describe in vivid detail some serious medical procedure. That's what I was really worried about. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I guess it was mostly safe. Hopefully it's safe past this point. But yeah, let's keep listening that I did. We're talking about great big singers, CCM Dove Award winning individuals, Christian so-called Hollywood actors, people that were in the sports world and making a difference for the kingdom and the cause of Christ, and now all of a sudden, well, you know, we don't quite believe as demonstratively as we used to, and some of them have just flat out come out agnostic and said, I don't even believe in this Jesus nonsense anymore. Why? Because many will depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits. It's interesting. So he's using the rise in lack of religious belief in the United States. He's using that as evidence that the Bible prophecy is coming to pass or whatever else. Um, okay, well, I, it's true that there is a, a slight rise in lack of religious belief. Slight. But it doesn't mean the end is here. You're going to have to give me a little more evidence than that to prove to me that the end of days is coming and that Armageddon is about to strike. You're going to have to show me something more substantive than people leaving an extremist religion behind. Because that could have happened whether God prophesied it or not, honestly.